You know, when you think about all the dynamics that God would encourage in our lives, you know, kind of those primary things that we would have as attitudes or mindsets, you know, you think about humility, uh, you know, you think about obedience, you think about purity, you think about righteousness, you think about godliness, you think about servanthood, all those different things. I hope that one of those things that is fairly primary in your life and my life as well is one of those things would be joy. Like when you think about the Christian life and all that God would desire for it to be, joy is part of that. And we have to understand that is part of that. You know, you wonder as Paul starts verse chapter 3, and actually there's no chapter verses in the Bible, but the choice that even the writers, you know, those who put those numbers in, you know, talked about this finally that um, Paul writes here. It means that he's turning a corner. He's not being the typical preacher that says finally and then speaks for 15 more minutes. Um, it's, more, it's more likely he's saying furthermore or now this is what we're going to talk about, changing the subject. And you think about what he's talked about in chapter 3. It's talking about you know, considering other people more important than yourself. So seeing Jesus and his sacrifice as a model of what we would be in terms of sacrificing ourselves for each other in terms of how we would treat each other, how we build up the, the unity of, of the body of Christ even within a local assembly. But then for him to say in the context of that, my brothers rejoice in the Lord. In other words, in the context of everything we do that is about sacrifice, it's about ser service, it's, it's about you know, railing ourselves in and, and doing things and denying ourselves to realize that God also wants us to be people of joy that we should always be rejoicing in the Lord. In fact, in verse 4, later on in the same book, he will say, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. I mean, joy is one of the main aspects of what, like the main theme of the book of Philippians. And so therefore, I want to take some time this morning to talk about joy and just realize the fact that, you know, if you don't have it, it's something that God would seek to establish as part of the dynamic you know, all those other things don't go away. Some of those things even might be more important than the joy you have. But to recognize that God's intent for our Christian life is that we would be joyful people. But first, joy, what is it? How would we define this thing? One uh, Bible dictionary says this, if the words would come up for me, uh, that, that biblical joy is a sense of delight and confidence in God, not merely happiness. Another Bible dictionary said it is more than a feeling, it is a quality of life, a sense of satisfaction or delight not affected by circumstances. C.S. Lewis in one of his books, you know, writes that it's really difficult to define what it is. <laughs> like, what, like, what is joy? We all know when we experience it, but really, what is it? Uh, but then says that anyone who has experienced it will want to experience again. And once we have tasted it, we would not exchange it for all the pleasures of the world. See, pleasure and happiness are fleeting and superficial. Joy is a settled delight, a constant satisfaction and completeness. You know, basically, joy is something that I think it's best identified is when we have it when the things in life aren't promoting joy. It's not promoting happiness. It's not promoting gladness in terms of what you're going through. But all of a sudden, you know, the relationship isn't what it's supposed to be. Your circumstances aren't turning out the way you want or whatever it might be. And you still have a joy. There's still something in your life that is about delight. It's about satisfaction. It's about this fullness that you have. That's joy. And to realize that that is part of God's intent for our lives. When you think about what why, why, like, like what, what joy is what Jesus wants us to have, you know, it's, it's what he wants. And so when you think about what it says in John 15, 11 here, he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You know, so basically the verses beforehand, and we're going to look at them in the context of this message, hopefully we get to it now that I've said that. I mean, but see, even to see that when Jesus calls us to obedience, when he calls us to respond to the love of God, his intent is that your joy would be complete, that, he, that effectively he, we would have his joy. In fact, Jesus brings up joy three times 
in this uh, t- time frame with his disciples in the upper room, this upper room discourse. And what's significant about that time frame, I mean, the, the hours that he's up, upstairs with them, realize that this is the last time he's going to have to teach them. The last time he's going to be able to instruct them in the things of the kingdom of God and what he would want them to understand. And to recognize in that context, he talks about joy three times. Realize that in merely hours, Jesus will be tried. He will be imprisoned. He will will be beaten. He will be brutalized. I don't know that Jesus knew exactly what would happen, but I think he had a sense of it. And just think about hours before that's going to happen, He's talking about other people about joy. He's even talking about his joy. To think about what the book of Hebrews says, that because of the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. So do you think joy was important to Jesus? Absolutely. And the next passage, John 17, 13, another place where Jesus mentions, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. So again, part of what Jesus seeks to translate to them is his joy. You know, you think about what kind of person Jesus was. Like when you think about Jesus, like do you think about Jesus having a good time? Do you think about Jesus laughing and smiling? What's unfortunate is most times we don't. We think about, gee, oh, well, he must have been the guy that he's righteous and he's holy, he's representing God, and so therefore, okay, let's get together and pray. No, don't laugh. Don't laugh. We have to pray. We have to read the Bible. We have to minister to the people. I think Jesus was smiling a lot. I think, again, Jesus was full of joy in the context of all that he's doing. You know, as he's, he's connecting to the will of his Father and fulfilling the will of his Father. He is gladdened by that. He has delight in his soul. And he wants to translate that to us as well. It's part of his will that we would have joy in our Christian lives. And when you think about the fruit of the Spirit... But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I mean, even to think that it makes this list, as Paul is trying to express the dynamics of what God wants to encourage through His Spirit, like what His Spirit brings to us, what the Spirit would develop in our lives. One of those is joy, and it's second on the list. I mean, I, can we necessarily say that God, you know, P- P- Paul is like, right, like rating these things, like, well, love's more important, self-control not so important, so it goes, I don't know that that's the case, but it says something that after love, and we wouldn't understand love would be a primary dynamic, right, that God would encourage us to have, right after that is joy. So he's not even expecting for us to come up with our own joy He says that he's going to provide that joy to us. I can guarantee you that part of the joy that Jesus does have in his life is the joy that the Holy Spirit brought to him. Like we have to remember as Jesus is living his life and he's being who he's supposed to be, he's not doing that by virtue of his divine nature. He's doing that by virtue of the Holy Spirit within him. And so therefore, when Jesus talks about my joy, that is the joy of the Holy Spirit. But that is is part of the dynamic of God. It's part of the nature of God. It's part of what God wants to develop in us. And it's just so easy for us to miss that. Like, I love a statement that people, that one writer wrote about worship services. And then sometimes when he's describing people coming to church or people coming to praise God. And it's like they're coming to a funeral rather than coming to a party. Like there's an aspect of coming to church where it's like we're coming to a party. I'm, I'm going to be reminded about how the God of the heavens loves me. I'm going to be reminded of all the things that he's accomplished, all the things I should be gladdened by, the delight that I should have in him. Wow! Like, think about the parties you go to and what happens there. Well, I talk to some people. I, you know, make some contacts. I get some business connections. You know, I, you know, learn about people. Like, really? Like, that, that, that's the best that that's going to offer you? And that's not bad. I'm not saying you don't hang out with friends, but I'm saying coming to church, 
That should be like, wow, I'm excited. Like there's going to be something that the church is going to bring to me that I couldn't do on my own. And you know one thing the church can offer? By definition, is other people. <laughs> like one, one thing you can't get on your own is other people. Because when you're all, all alone, you don't have other people. And so part of the church is the people that we have, the encouragement that comes from other people, the reminders we get of the greatness and goodness of God. Like even the conviction of God, even the knowledge of the truth he would have for us to lead us in a way that might, you know, reject the sin nature, reject the temptation of Satan, and lead us into righteousness, that also is to be something that generates joy in our life. But to connect with God. So Jesus wants us to have joy. Joy is a natural response to the things of God. Like when we engage with the things of God, when we understand what God has done, maybe when we are in those moments where we are more intentionally thinking about the work of God, thinking about the promises of God, think about what God has done and revealed in the Word, word, in the word what He has done in our own lives. I love 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9, where it says, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Even though you don't not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That inexpressible joy, when we recognize the nature of the salvation that God gives us, the work that God did through Jesus Christ to, to pay for our sins, to die for us so we could live, that He would deny Himself so we could have all the great things that God would bring to our life and an inexpressible joy about that. No one can ever take that away. No one can ever, like, redefine that. No one can ever say it's not yours or it's not available or you can't get it, you're not worthy. No one can ever say that. And so, therefore, an inexpressible joy should come when we think about that great salvation. You know, the other, pl the, the other part, point, rather, that Jesus brings up joy is this in the upper room discourse, is here. Until now you have not asked me for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Here's that prayer point that Mark always wants me to bring. bring. <laughs> like, like, there's an aspect of you <clears throat> coming before God, asking for him, for him for things, and then he answers, then he provides, then he gives. We know how glad we are when that happens, Right? We, we, we know the joy we have that, you know something, that the, the child is sick or I lost my job or I don't know how I'm going to pay the bill and all of a sudden the check comes in or the job comes through or whatever it might be. And so therefore, when God answers prayer, see the natural response, the point I'm trying to make, the natural response to the work of God is for us to have joy, to recognize what that does in reinforcing and validating our faith the faith that should, again, cause us not to be shaken, should sustain us through everything, that, that it's, it's a faith that even when God isn't working and he's not moving, we still have joy. But boy, the joy we have when he is moving, when, when, he, when he does work, when, when, he, when, the, when he does answer prayer. That, that's what Jesus is talking about here. You know, this passage in Luke 10, 17, in terms of just seeing that joy is a natural response to the work of God. You know, at one point in time, one of the amazing things that Jesus does is he sends out 70 people that kind of had been involved in his ministry, impacted by him, and were hanging around. You're going to go out and minister in my name. And so therefore, they come back, the 72, they return now. I think, it's, I think there's a... Never mind, I won't go into that. There's 70, 72. The numbers can, are different in different places. Um, and so therefore, um, they returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. And so this is them expressing, I got to connect with the power of God. Like I, 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 like, I don't have the capacity to heal someone. I, I don't have the capacity to cast out a demon. Never have done it in my life before. And now I'm there representing Jesus, 
and now all of a sudden I can do it. What joy comes to us? And what I would compare that to is what joy comes to us when we do act in service. That when we do, we are the hands and feet of God. That we are used in someone else's life. That someone is down and I come to them and I encourage them. And boy, the words coming out of my mouth aren't really mine. Like there's a joy in acting in your spiritual gift and letting the power of God flow through you. That is very exciting in terms of what God intends for the Christian life. Like you hear, if you've been around me, I, I just think about the excitement that a, an electrical cord or even a light has to be lit. Again, they're not thinking, but think about what a great thing for a light bulb that isn't lit, then all of a sudden it's lit. There, there, there's a lot of power making that happen. Wouldn't you agree? 110, 110 you can measure it. 110 power coming to the pl plug, through the plug, and to the light. You know what we are in the Christian life? We're lights. And then, so therefore, what we need to make sure is we're always connected to the power of God. But to have that power flow through us, and then all of a sudden we're used by virtue of that, again, that is something. The natural response of that is joy. That, that's why Jesus says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. Because when you give, there's going to be a joy that comes from the inside. See, if you receive something, all you're receiving is external Thank you for the gift. I now have the fishing pole I've always wanted. Okay, now what can I do? I can fish. Good for you. You go with that. Like the point I'm making is it's just external. But when we give to someone, we, can, we get in touch with a spiritual godly dynamic that does something to us on the inside. And so that's why it's more blessed to give than to receive because we have the power of God flowing through us. And so joy, some reasons for it. We'll have to go through, through these fairly quickly, but we are members of the kingdom of God. Think about that for a little bit. We are members of the kingdom of God, a kingdom of power, authority, protection, and supreme in everything. There is nothing that anyone could ever offer that's better than this. I mean, think about the things that gladden your heart, like, oh, I got into Harvard. I've got this degree that says I took all the classes and I passed the test and I'm a graduate of Harvard. You know, I got to go to the Capitol Grill. Like, not everyone gets to go. I'm not saying I did. Well, at one time in my life. But, I, I, you know, some, the steak tastes about just the same as they, at the Outback. Let me, let me just say. It's, it's, like, I, you talk to me about why they... But, it, but the point being, like, you kind of are glad, and right? I get to be part of the society. I, I got my, I'm a Phi Beta Kappa. I'm a ba 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 ba. You are part of the kingdom of God. When Jesus came to the earth, and again, he's, he's in the lowest point that anyone could be in the context of their earthly experience. He's before the judge, the earthly judge, and he says, well, why aren't you fighting? If you're a king, why are you here? Well, because my kingdom is not of this earth. My kingdom is an eternal kingdom. My kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And you know something? It's really unfair even to say you're just members of the kingdom because you are princes and princesses. That you are a child of the king in the context of that kingdom. And again, there's nothing better than that. That there's always a place for joy because, again, nothing, nothing in their earth compares to it. Nothing on the earth can assail it. Nothing on this earth can take it away. It is yours by virtue of your relationship with Jesus Christ. And again, that is a reason for joy. And it's a reason for joy that is sustaining. Again, I love that, that stanza that we had in that last song where I'm not going to be shaken. 
You know, it's going to be a, God's love is a firm foundation. I know where I stand before the king of the universe. Nothing, nothing better. Priceless, you know, the MasterCard commercial, this costs this much, priceless. God loves you and has promised to never leave you. Think about what it means that the creator of the universe, the authority of the universe, the judge of the universe comes to you and says, I love you. That my heart to you is goodness. My heart to you is favor. My heart to you is care. Like, like I'm, I'm crazy about you. I think well about you. I, I desire good things for you. But it's not as an automaton. It's not as a slave. It's, it's uh, because I love you. And I desire good things for you. And I will never leave you. That there's never a point in our lives where, oh, I guess I'm on my own here. I guess I got to do it on my own here. No, God never leaves you. You can always cry out to him. Another aspect of, again, a reason for joy is we are overcomers. We have the power to change. You know, in some ways, it's not fair to talk about John 15, 11 without talking about the context in John 15, 9, and 10. But this is what Jesus says. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. Remain in my love, that firm foundation. If you keep my commands, you remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. And then he says, I tell these things to you so that your joy will be complete. But it's all about the fact that God loves you, so therefore Jesus says, I love you. But the way that you realize God loves you, the real way that you co cooperate with that love is by obeying the commandments. Because if you see that the commandments are anything but loving you, then you're missing the point. So when God says, don't do this, God is loving you by saying, don't do this. Hopefully, when your parents say, don't do this, they're doing that because they love you. Like they recognize the danger that's out there, the wrong path you will be on, the wrong associations you will make, by them directing you in a path. But again, it's because they love you. They care about you. They're connected to you. They desire good things for you. And so that is what God is, is, is defining his kingdom by, de defining the aspect of his command. Like, like in other words, I, I'm commanding you because I love you. But then when you recognize, like in palpable, practical ways, that the way God is loving me is by giving me the commands. And so then I follow the commands to therefore love him. That's when the joy becomes complete. That, that's when this, har this harmony between. And it's not, and it's not God. It, it is not God saying, like, well, the only way that you're going to get something from me is if you do something for me. It is God saying that the only thing I can support is my will. Like, we cannot blame God for that. Like, like the, the only way for me to love you, God would say, is, is tell you my commands and ask you to follow them. And so, therefore, you show you love me by trusting. See, to me, it's about the relationship. It's about understanding God's heart. Like, when I obey the commands because of love... I'm recognizing the heartbeat of the kingdom of God. I'm recognizing the, the heartbeat of the way God operates. And when I do that and I get to that place, that's when the joy is complete. And that's the, to the point that Jesus is making. Oh, boy, oh, boy. I, I, I think we'll, and it's not all of Psalm 103. That's your homework assignment, okay? Read Psalm 103, you know, bless the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and don't forget all his benefits. Don't forget all his benefits. The kind of God he is, the forgiveness he brings, 
The, 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 you know, separating your, your, your sin as far as the east is from the west in terms of all that God provides. I think the other thing that... Uh, oh, yeah, I... Okay. So, so again, those are, some, those are reasons for joy. The, 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 so, so, yeah, so we can get to this, this point. So why is it important? So, again, we've seen what it is. We've seen that it's a natural response to the things of God. We've seen you know, things that bring it, but why is it important? It's not a nicety, it's a necessity. Joy in the Christian life is not a nicety, it's a necessity. I used to, you know, I know I said this at the Thursday morning Bible study most recently, but sometimes it's just priming myself in the Bible studies for what I'm going to say on the Sunday morning. I hope you can get that. But anyway, so anyway, so, so uh, like I used to think that joy was the icing on the cake. And then there was a point where God showed me joy is the cake. Like, and not, not revelation, just reading the word and understanding the powerful aspect of what joy means to our life. Joy is the cake. So again, it's a necessity. The joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah 8.10 says. We won't look that one up. Just trust. So again, this is the, go, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared this day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so again, the joy of the Lord is your strength. This next statement is significant in terms of it drives out the competition. Joy drives out the competition. The reason why your sin nature has power in your life is because you don't have enough joy. The reason why Satan can tempt you with what I, he has is because you don't have enough joy. Because what joy does, if, joy, if the joy of the Lord is my strength, I think what that means is when I go into battle, like praise is that weapon, I'm, praise reminds me of the goodness of God, but it's the joy in my heart that says, why would I give this up? Why would I let this thing that is less compromise that thing that is greater? And teens, 20-somethings, again, if you don't get that, you need to get that. Like, you have to understand everything the world is telling you is a lie. To the extent that the world says it's not God, it's not the Bible, it's not Jesus, it's not the church, it's not the Spirit, it's, it's, it's you and finding your own way, and I'm going to be maximize myself and do all the things that I want to do. No, 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 no. You, you be the person God wants you to be. You find the joy that he has for you. And so therefore, whatever happens in life now doesn't matter because you have God. And so again, if you are not getting joy from the Lord, I promise some will be offering it to you from somewhere else. And so that's what we have to recognize. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It is also a great motivator. Matthew 13, 4 says this, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. And so therefore, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, is like a treasure we find. Like, oh my gosh, I have this? Well, well, well now I understand this. I, lo I love meeting people that come to Jesus in their 40s, their 30s, you know, later in life. Well, it's like, oh my God, like I, I thought I knew the thing. I, th I was doing the thing. I was making the money. I had the whatever. And it was empty. And now I recognize everything that God brings me in Christ, in the Spirit, in the Word, and I've never been happier. Like I've never had more joy, more full. It's not even fair to call it happy. I've never been delighted, sustained in that delight confident of that goodness and that gratification that I have with God. But again, do, like if, if, if you are ever sacrificing something for God and you don't have joy in it, I would suggest you find the joy first and then sacrifice to God. Because it is the joy, it's for the joy that he had in finding the kingdom of heaven. I give every like now, like almost like C.S. Lewis said, once you have that joy, once you know what it is, like 
Nothing compares to that. See, nothing compares to something that happens in my soul that, again, is above what the world can offer, above what, you know, the world can attack and take away. More powerful than that. Again, that is far more important, far better. So, again, let let the joy of the Lord be your strength, be the reason why I'm sacrificing to God. The problem about making slides is I have one more point. I just didn't want to fit it in the slide. It, it is a great sustainer. It, it, is, is a, it is a great compensator. Like, like you, you think about first, as you are engaging in life, as you are dealing with conflict, as you are dealing with hard situations, you're dealing, like just imagining having joy in the context of that. And now what you do in the situation with joy, as opposed to agitation or anger or vengeance or I I gotta get mine, I gotta defend myself. What if you had joy? You know, when you're calling the credit card company or the phone company or you're dealing with DEM, I mean DMV rather, oh and DEM. (laughs) Like like, I still have joy. Like, I'm still going to say what I'm going to say. I still am going to make the point that I'm going to make. But imagine having that joy. Think about deal, having a conversation in your marriage between your wife and husband, wife, mother and child or father, and you have joy when you're talking about it. Like, like, like it, it connects you to the, the, the kingdom that is above, that is greater. <laughs> like, 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 regardless of what happens here, I'm still going to have that. So, I, like, again, I'm, I'm going to present the truth and speak the truth and want the truth and desire the truth. But if it doesn't happen, I still have this joy. You know, when the Bible says that, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. You know, when the apostles, after being imprisoned for their faith in Jesus, come out, and what does the book of Acts say? They were joyful because they had the, they, they were, they, they were uh, identified with Jesus, like they identified with the suffering of Jesus. Like in the same way Jesus suffered, look at it, we just got to suffer. We just got beaten too. We just put in prison. Oh, awesome. Like that's, a, like that's a sustaining thing. Like you want that because God doesn't promise a rose garden. Things aren't always going to work out well. But if you have a sustaining joy that says, okay, I've got this, so therefore when bad things happen... I can still be joyful. And so maybe even particularly, as we we think about communion, we think about remembering Jesus. I I, want to make sure that you remember, not to take any wins out of Mark's sale, whatever. Remember that a dynamic of the Christian life, a dynamic of what God desires for you as his child, this is only for people that are believers, Like, you only have this, you only have the joy of God as you're a believer, and again, you're following Him, you're following the commands and making that connection of love in the context of that. But just realize that's what God wants for you. It's not just about the sacrifice. It's not just about denying yourself. It's not just about serving. It's about having joy in all of it. Let's bow and let's pray. Father, Father, I just do pray that we do all find the joy that is overcoming. I do pray that we find the joy that does drive out the competition, that, 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 it, that it occupies our soul so nothing else can come in and, and come against it in, in, in terms of what we would then choose and do based on the, based on the joy that we have. And so, Father, I just pray that that, that would be something that is uh, contagious to the world, that, that as we are joyful people, people would come up to us and say, why are you so joyful? <laughs> hey, well, why are you always the same in, in terms of your joy? Well, I'm connected to a different kingdom. I pray that we find that. I pray that as we celebrate Jesus and remember him, that you use this time uh, to grow, have us grow in our belief, grow in our appreciation, grow in our conviction about doing what he would have us to do. And so, Father, bless this time as we sanctify it to you. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, that we do pray.